Yo, Frumley. Yo, buckle up because episode 5 just threw more twists than a pretzel in a Brooklyn deli. Dale! Y'all saw Dale tried to shoot his shot this weekend. <laughs> Boy, did he brick harder than a kid missing a layup at recess. Yo, this episode is titled The Light of Day, which, as many episodes do, has multiple meanings. For one, we're finally seeing Tabitha and the rest of the Frumtown residents see the light of day after a harrowing night in town. Plus, Jade begins to make a breakthrough in trying to figure out the clues when he has an opportunity to examine the bottle tree. And, probably my favorite one and the one with some dark humor, is that poor Dale gets caught up in a situation where he's barely able just to see a peak of the light of day. Poor stupid Dale. Anyway, he meant well, but man, was he stupid. All right, family, you know the drill. If you're ready to get your mind twisted tighter than a pretzel at a carnival, smash that like button, and if you're new, subscribe, right? Let's turn this breakdown into a full-blown deep dive faster than Boyd can fire off one of those cryptic looks. The goal right now is to try to get to 30,000 subscribers. That's what I was told is the goal to try to get some more opportunities. We had a little bit of momentum, but things slowed down. I can see in the statistics that 85% of you who are watching are not subscribed. Come on, y'all, please do me a favor. Hit that like button, subscribe, comment, and watch more videos. All right? Thank you. Go ahead. Let's go ahead and dive into it. This episode picks up right after last week's events where Randall is now back. But it looks like he picked a fight with a cheese grater and lost. I mean, they really sliced him up like a $5 deli special. The people in Colony House bring Randall inside to get checked out, and he is in pain. Right, Randall sees Boyd and he starts spazzing out like Boyd borrowed his car and returned it with no gas and dented the bumper. Dude's ready to swing if his face wasn't already halfway fallen off. Boyd kinda sorta sees his point and tries his best to help him in this moment. I like what the monsters did here because this is further proof that the monsters are playing psychological warfare on the residents and even maybe specifically at Boyd. They hurt Randall and sent him back to be a figure for everyone to see. You know, he's like a visual reminder of the situation that they're in with these monsters. It's also alluding to the idea that there's absolutely something still special about Randall because this seems like his second encounter with the monsters where he was left alive. The first time when he got swarmed by the cicadas in season two, he collapsed in the forest while being pursued by the monsters. It feels like the show is trying to tell us that there's now something important about Randall and that the monsters may want to keep him alive. Is Randall still possessed by the cicada monster? It, it kind of feels like it. Switching over to Jade, Kenny, and Christy, we see them returning from their supply run. Christy's miracle foot that somehow survived a bear trap needs a checkup. Marielle is shooketh and immediately takes Christy inside to get checked out. Kenny and Jade want answers as to why there's an EMT truck in front of the clinic. Jade then hears about Tabitha being back, and suddenly he's like a kid in the candy store. My man is sprinting to go see her because, if you haven't noticed, Jade has been chasing down clues harder than a detective in a noir flick. And you know what that means. More of Jade's glorious brain at work. Meanwhile, Henry's over here treating From Town's involuntary donation bin like it's a Macy's sale. My guy is trying to look sharp as he's genuinely excited to see Victor. Donna says this is the this is the old Navy section. Come with me over to the gap. It's right upstairs. And Henry follows closely behind. Side note, can we talk about how no one's mentioned Victor's uh state? I mean, you'd think after everything, he'd be the top of the list for people that you should talk to about this and no. No, we're not going to. All right. Look, Henry's out here trying to put his best foot forward with JC Penny level threads while Victor's probably somewhere drawing nightmare fuel on the walls. We'll just we'll just keep going. OK, we'll just keep going. We didn't switch to Victor and Sour making their way to get supplies. Victor was able to remember the terrifying fact that Christopher had a talking demon puppet that seemed to agonize Christopher at some point. Victor says that they need supplies to make sure they don't get lost as they're planning to go explore the tunnels to go find Jasper. They head inside Colony House when Victor sees the chaos and he asks, whose blood is this everywhere? Tilly 
responds and tells them that we lost the former NPC, Nikki. Plus, Tabitha is back in from town. Oh, and last but not least, Victor's dad is in from town. Victor either doesn't believe or doesn't want to hear nothing about his dad being in from town and rushes out the door. Sarah genuinely seems confused as she thought Victor was coming back with supplies. Victor doesn't really explain why he just darted off at first until Sarah goes off on his ass because she didn't feel like playing with him today. He blurts out that he heard about his dad is here and says that they'll get Jasper later before he darts off again. Now, I like how this episode is setting up this meeting. It's, it's better that we get the payoff later because that moment is genuinely one of my favorite moments in this series. We switch back to Tabitha explaining to her family what it is that she did in the real world. Julie wants Tabitha to make it make sense and Jim is still delusional when he says, the only thing that matters is that she's back and we're together. Now, look, this behavior from Jim has been weird to me from the beginning, right? He's clearly exhibiting his own sort of trauma from losing Thomas as he's obsessed with the idea of resolution and togetherness. No, Jim, we, we have to get out of this purgatory, not roast in it together. But it's like he can't see past his own need for nearness from his family. Either way, Jade bursts in and ruins Jim's sanctity and Jade wants to talk to Tabitha. Jim is trying to protect his number one priority in life, his concepts of a marriage. Jade asks Tabitha about how she went through a tree. In this mofo, Ethan starts spitting some wisdom again when he starts talking about the faraway trees. But these adults have their heads so far up their asses that they're immediately dismissing Ethan, even though he seems the most knowledgeable about the trees. And he even said that Victor is the one who told him. Now, I've said this before in other videos, but we must always pay attention to when Ethan starts talking about this place, the quest, and the Kramanakal. This goes back to figuring out how the writers work. And one thing that we've seen consistently is that the writers use Ethan as a conduit for explaining important details about this place and its rules. Ethan doesn't realize it, but he knows the most about this place. But the idea of an adult taking advice from a child is such a foreign concept in most people's minds that it's not even considered. Jade immediately disregards Ethan and resumes talking to Tabitha and asks about the lighthouse. What's interesting is that the first thing Jade asks is if Tabitha knows how to get back there without the tree. And that's really interesting to me. Jade immediately wants to eliminate the variable with the tree and wants to get to the lighthouse without it. I love how Jade's mind works and I kind of wish he would have taken a moment to explain why he wants to go back without using the tree. But Dale learns the hard way. Jim then admits that he went to the faraway tree off camera and says there's nothing to see there. And Jade appropriately gives him shit for being stupid enough to disregard the magic tree that he didn't say anything about to anyone. Jim admits that not only did he go to the tree off camera, but he also checked out the bottles at the tree and looked at the slips of paper. Now, I will give Taryn credit for noticing that my guy Jim is the only guy in Prime Town who climbs trees, but he didn't think it was important enough to do it on camera. So, pick up two for your mistake. Jade gives him more shit and demands to be taken to the tree. Tabitha says that she has to go to the town meeting first. We then switch back to Kenny and Boyd at Christie's clinic, discussing how they need concepts of a plan to go back to the settlement and get the rest of the food they left behind. Kenny also lets Boyd know that there's a whole nother threat out in the forest that isn't the monsters. Boyd takes it all in stride but decides it's not the immediate priority right now. Randall can be heard suffering in the background and Kenny reads my mind and asks why did the monsters leave Randall alive? Boyd theorizes that the monsters didn't just let Randall live out of mercy. Nah. <laughs> These creatures are playing psychological warfare. Randall is their billboard, right? A bloody reminder that even when the sun's up, there is no safe haven. The fact that they let him live, it wasn't an accident. It feels like Randall's got something that they want, but they're keeping him alive just long enough to figure out what. And of course, we're all wondering, is he still carrying some cicada monster within him? We then switch to Marielle and Christy with Marielle looking over Christy's mangled ankle. When Christy miraculously keeps her foot, I was like, girl, you were blessed by the healing gods of From or something. We've seen less plot armor in superhero movies. 
Christy may have been in worse shape and just healed overnight, kind of like Ellis' broken arm and stab wound, but who knows? Marielle and Christy then have a chat about Marielle taking on too much and putting herself at risk of a relapse. Marielle tells Christy to chill out because she's the one who can't walk and let her be doctor right now with Christy not able to follow. Marielle goes to check on Randall and Boyd tries to come help too, but Marielle lets Boyd know that that's a stupid idea. It's time for him to go focus on that meeting he scheduled with Tabitha and the townspeople. We then switch to Donna and Henry going through Victor's stuff in his room. Look, we all know how much Victor loves when people go through his room and his stuff when he's not around, but you know, here we are. Henry takes a few moments to have a small pity party and think about how much time he lost with his son. We even have a few moments when Henry is talking about how Victor was alone. And that's when the camera pans and focuses on the drawing of the white monster on the wall. Hmm. Donna says some words of encouragement and then they head out to go to the meeting. Alright, we then move on to the town meeting where the tension is thicker than Donna's poker face. Dill has his last big moment of speaking lines in the show. Tabitha rolls in and the moment she says, I went through a tree, the room might as well have exploded. We then switch to Julie heading in the colony house after everyone leaves, going into Ellis and Fatima's room and looking out the window. She has a moment reminiscing about how Fatima was low-key flirting with her, but I don't think anybody's ready to have that conversation. She also happens to know exactly where Fatima and Ellis keep their personal stash of weed and proceeds with stealing their stuff, not at all feeling like she's crossing any sort of line or, you know, couples private things. Again, nobody wants to talk about that. Um, she then heads downstairs, runs into her real crush, Elgin, who almost smashes her over the head with a chimney tool. She proceeds to shoot her shot with Elgin and again invites him to hang out. We then switch to Victor and Sarah over at Victor's mom's car and hold the F up. How the hell does Sarah know about the car graveyard? It doesn't seem like she directly followed Victor here and it instead feels like Victor was there alone and Sarah went looking for him. Hmm. How does she know about this place? Or better yet, how does she know to look for him? Did someone tell her to find him here? Hmm. Victor talks about how he never drew pictures of his dad and talks about how he told himself how some things was just a dream and he told himself something that, but then he cuts himself off. Thought what was a dream? This, this feels like he was about to say something important again and stopped himself short. Sarah tries to give Victor a pep talk, but even Victor calls her out for being terrible at pep talks. She tries again and does a better job and we see that Avery Conrad is out here acting, acting too. Yo, it's like the entire cast is stepping their game up for season three and we have a heartwarming moment. We then switch to Elgin and Julie talking about the zombie lady he sees while pretending to smoke weed. Elgin then talks about his grandmother again and says how his grandmother would probably theorize that the kimono woman was an angel. He says, and I quote, Remember now, there's a reason why angels say fear not when they see someone. Even Gabriel was terrifying. Hmm. In the Bible, Gabriel is an archangel who appears in both the Old and New Testaments and is a prominent figure in the nativity story. Gabriel was the angel who told Mary that she would give birth to Jesus Christ. Gabriel was also the angel who told Zechariah that his wife Elizabeth would give birth to John the Baptist. There are quite a few stories in which Gabriel appears and he was one of only two angels who are named in the entire Bible. Julie talks about how she trade the screaming in her ears for the kimono lady any day of the week and how smoking weed helps. Julie then says she thinks this place exists to make them suffer. To make them suffer would give them hope. Now, those of you who watch my live streams know my theory about this place and how I think the monsters feed on hopelessness. I haven't edited it properly into a separate video yet, but I'll put a link in the comments with the timestamp so you can go and listen to my theory and catch up on what is actually going on here. We then switch back to Tabitha finishing up her story about being in the real world. Like I said, the room was a powder keg and the next thing we know, Fatima goes on the attack like she's auditioning for Real Housewives of From Town and even had some innocent bystanders catching strays. They're all coming for Tabitha questioning why she didn't get help when she was in the real world. 
Tabitha gives the same excuse as the writers that she didn't think anyone would believe her. The resident starts having a fit, including Donna, but Fatima is the loudest person among the group. Donna even catches a stray when Dale throws a jab at his secret lover, Donna, and Donna and Boyd seem to be the ones picking who and what is important. Dale and Fatima then start taking turns beating up on Tabitha like they're fighting for the tag team titles to the point where she throws in the towel and decides to go home. Boyd, ever the peacemaker, tries to calm everyone down, but Dale and the rest aren't having it. Dale's tired of the mystery, tired of the leadership, and tired of Boyd's speeches. He decides to take matters into his own hands and head straight for one of the faraway trees. And if you're thinking, wow, Dale's about to get some answers, spoiler alert, this ain't it. This ain't it. We then switch to Jade and Ethan with Jade dropping corporate wisdom about how any meeting with more than three people is essentially a waste of time. Tabitha comes bursting in and says she's taking Jade to the tree. Jim is not at all happy with the idea of Tabitha shattering his concepts of a family and explains to Tabitha that Ethan risked his life more than once by going into the forest by himself and looking for Tabitha. Tabitha listens to reason and says that she'll only take Jade and they walk off. We then switch to see Boyd and Ellis catching up after the meeting with Ellis getting on my last fucking nerve for being an inexperienced idiot. Just because you got your girl pregnant doesn't make you wise. Boyd must be from the Bronx because he can't even find the words to argue with his child about his stupidity. Whose life is Ellis willing to risk in the magic tree and Ellis shuts all the way up. Boyd then realizes that he's arguing with a child and comes to his senses about arguing with a fool and then storms off. We then switch back to Julie and Elgin heading into the basement of Colony House and holy shit there's a basement? I've come to the conclusion that anytime From Town takes us into a basement that we're going to see something important. Elgin opens up a chest of some 70s things and that was being stored in the basement with them deciding to play dress up. What's interesting though is when they find a Polaroid camera in the chest and this immediately makes me think of the Polaroid picture of Christopher standing in front of the diner. Is this Christopher's camera? They take a couple of pictures and we see what we see when Elgin takes a picture, but the interesting thing is that the show cuts away before we see Julie's picture. I have a feeling that there's something going on with her and maybe we'll get a clue when that photo finishes developing. We then switch to Boyd and his so-called precinct with Acosta coming in to visit. Acosta wants to be helpful and gives a suggestion to give people of the town a project to work on. Boyd's holding onto his sanity like it's on the back order from Amazon just barely holding on, and you know the delivery is going to be late. That's right, Boyd starts unloading on Acosta, and it's all on his- the police coming straight from the underground. Now, there's a few things interesting at this moment. One, Boyd is acting way out of character. Two, Acosta is not making any friends in From Town. And three, Boyd is acting way out of character. This is a clear moment where someone is coming to Boyd to level up on some hope and feel useful and rather than inspiring hope like he normally does, he decides to spit some venom at her and gets, kicks her the fuck out of his office. This definitely reduces the hope points even further in this town. You said this place couldn't break you. Yes it can. This is one of the clearest signs that this place is finally starting to wear Boyd down and we're seeing this place break him in a way that we didn't see coming. I've said it before and I'll say it again, a broken Boyd reduces his ability to instill hope in the residents and instill hopelessness instead that powers up the dark entity. We'll get back to that. We then switch to Fatima heading to the greenhouse to grab a snack with Ellis, noticing his wife sneaking off and following behind. He walks into the greenhouse behind her and Fatima acts like a kid who got caught doing drugs by their parents. Ellis ain't with the shit and starts reminding her that she's carrying his kid and she needs to give him some freaking answers. And she decides to show him that she's eating garbage and she thinks that something is wrong. We then switch to Ethan. Wait, wasn't Jim supposed to be watching Ethan? How is this little dude just walking out the front door of the house unsupervised? That was Jim that was making a big deal about this, wasn't it? This is what I'm talking about. Anyway. Ethan heads out and sees Henry pointing out the same thing that I've been pointing out when he talks about how there's a motel sign, there's a pool, but there's no motel. Ethan 
doesn't know what to do with that question and instead asks if Henry is Victor's dad. They start making introductions and seem to become fast friends with Ethan asking if Henry has seen Victor yet. They talk a bit about how Ethan and Victor are best friends with Henry not questioning the comment. And then... We didn't see Victor and Sarah walking with Victor fi- Oh my... Finally! Yo, yo, I didn't know if he was going to get this moment in this episode, but OMG, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank you. I'm not crying. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to hold it together. I didn't even know I needed this, but yes. And damn, yo, Scott McCord is out here acting, acting too. And he's just a little boy. Yo. This moment was everything. We then switched to Bakta and Boyd. Boyd is in Randall's mobile home going through his stuff and coming across the wood carving that Randall was making. Kind of looks like the skull from the Scarecrows, doesn't it? Bakta immediately wants to know what's going on and Boyd is honest about feeling guilty. Bakta apologizes for not supporting him and promises to be more supportive in the future the next time Boyd needs backup. We then switch to Jade and Tabitha in the bottle tree with Jade trying to get one of the bottles down. They've gotten a few down and we see that Jade still needs help with climbing trees. Huh. He shares his theory that the numbers might be dates. Tabitha isn't as optimistic and then Jade shares that he also saw the Ankui kids and I love this. I love that Jade is sharing information and he confirms to Tabitha that there's a connection between her vision of the Garbage Pail Kids and the symbol that he keeps seeing. Now this moment, this moment, it's huge. Dale walks into the faraway tree thinking he's about to unlock the secrets of the universe only to end up in the wall, literally. That's right, the man gets teleported into the motel's concrete like the world's worst magic trick. One moment you're walking into the unknown, the next you're part of the architecture. And let me tell you, when Boyd rolls up to see Dale's body sticking out of that wall, he starts firing off one of his coldest monologues ever. Boyd's basically like, this is what happens when y'all don't listen. And he's not wrong. Boyd's been saying from day one that the trees aren't something to mess with. And here we are. Dale's dumbass just became an exhibit A of why you should listen to Boyd. Donna walks over and sees the sight of her secret lover in the wall. With the, and then we see the heartbreak in her eyes and then end credits and that's a wrap on episode 5 look this episode was a roller coaster we got deep emotional beats high stakes drama and of course Dale literally stuck in a wall but some big stuff did happen this episode we saw Randall's not just scarred he's got the face of someone who just found out that fast food isn't fast and now he's Boyd's walking billboard of trauma, showing everyone exactly what it looks like when the monsters toy with you. Fatima let Ellis know that she's been eating garbage, and now he has to deal with that. Boyd's trying to lead like a guy reading Ikea instructions. He's got the general idea, but somehow the pieces never quite fit, you know? Leadership in From Town is like playing chess with a toddler. Pieces are flying everywhere and no one's following the rules. But wait, it's not all doom and gloom. No, From actually hit us with a moment so sweet I almost forgot this show thrives on trauma. Victor finally reunites with his dad. And y'all, the tears were real. Scott McCord is out here acting like he's gunning for an Emmy. This reunion, perfection. And it's these little moments of heart in the middle of the chaos that keep us coming back. Just when you think From is all about fear, they hit you with the feels. Uh, and of course, the biggest moment we see, you know, again, the faraway trees take you wherever the F they want to take you, even the bottle tree. I've said this before, and some of y'all kind of thought my idea was silly, but we have more evidence to show that the faraway trees have a temperament. Tabitha wanted to save the children, so the bottle tree took her to the lighthouse. Dale wanted to save himself, so the bottle tree turned him into an art installation. So, I don't know, I guess I'll pat myself on the back for this one, even if no one else will. Oh, and I still think Donna and Dale were secret lovers. 
Anyway, that's all I have for this one. Again, if you guys are new here to the movie blog, do me a favor. Please, 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 please. Hit this like button. Hit this like button. Hit this like button. 80% of y'all ain't hitting the like button, y'all. Please hit this like button and subscribe. I'm proud of the clobber was ready to do this. The light of the Thank you so much, Scott. Hey, I'm out here representing the Frumley here from the New York Comic Con. Wanted to just bring a little bit of From here to New York Comic Con this year, 2024. Oh, um, that's amazing. Thank you. I wanted to just, you know, represent the Frumley. Come in costume. I've got my talisman with me. I'm I'm doing it all the way. You I have wish me. I think that Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I'll start from here. Uh, okay. Victor's been in this. Uh, well, first off, I didn't get to this speak to you directly last time when I asked you, why is this show called Prawn? Um, but I'm going to go to something deep this time. Uh, okay. Victor's been in this creepy little town uh, longer than anyone, right? Yeah. He's been, yeah. he's been through it. He's been through it. Yeah. Um, can you tell us, does Victor really know what's going on? Or is he just playing with us? Like, is he the key to unlock, you know, madness? Or is he a lost with the rest of us? I know, this seems to be like a big debate, you know, with a lot of people. I think, this is what I'll say, is I think that, you know, we know that, that Victor's, you know, he suffered this, this, I mean, an immense trauma as a child. He was left alone there for a long time. And I think, you know, he has locked away <clears throat> memories and, and certainly probably certain truths about this, about this place that are just really, really scary for him to, to deal with. And he, and I think he's, the problem is, is that he's seen too many people try and solve this place and they probably don't survive. And that's always been his conflict. Um, I mean, you know, as to whether, you know, is he holding the secrets to this place that could solve the whole problem? I don't think he, I don't think he is in the sense that he, you know, that he's no, he knows that and that he, um, and he's just withholding information. I think the, I think the memories that he does have are very traumatic. And while they might provide, you know, something, something to help him get out of there. Uh, I think that, that, that. He doesn't know how reliable they are, those memories, you know? Uh, I mean, you know, it's last season, for instance, he didn't even know, he could he didn't remember that he had a, you know, he had his sister, he had a sister. He locked that away, you know, and that was a really painful experience for him. So, so, uh, yeah, but you know, as to whether he is like holding the key to the whole place or whatever. Ben. Victor's whole life has been like a horror show that just won't end, right? Like, and and he had this fantastic scene where like he reunited with his father Henley here in this season. I believe this Sunday when I mean people get to watch this uh, deep dive. And the way that you're portraying your character, specifically in episode five, right? When people are going to go nuts when they see that reunion with Victor and his dad Henley. Um, what what going to? How did you bring all of that to light? Uh, yeah, thanks. And that's just, uh, it's a great question. I think a lot of it is just, you know, I, uh, I mean, you know, as an actor approaching something like that, as terrifying as it could be sometimes, you know, especially something that emotionally, you know, uh, big, uh, and, uh, I think it's, you know, finding ways to, that's just my own homework of just finding ways that I could relate to it in some way, you know, to make it as real as possible. And, uh, I mean, I'll see this. I mean, there's certain things that I could bring to the table that I can work on, uh, that of my own experience, I think a lot of it too, just had to be to show up and just see what was on the other side of me. The actor, Robert Joy, who plays my dad, um, we didn't connect all that much before that scene was shot. So we were kind of like almost really having that moment for the first time. And I think that there was something about that and in John's writing and in the fact that Victor says, you know, I haven't, I was, I didn't know that I didn't know how to get back home. That just seemed to open up this whole well of pain and this lifetime lost between these two characters. Yeah. Uh, I think sometimes it's just the beauty of it's just in, and, and it's all there on the writing, you know, and just trusting.
that that is an amazing scene. Like that that scene is going to touch so many hearts on on this Sunday when they get to see it. Oh, um, hope so. Yeah, great to hear, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you so much for your time. You can add. And uh, that's it from Lee. That's all I have for this interview with Scott Laporte. Uh, unfortunately, I ran out of time with Scott. A uh, little heartbreaking, you know, cosplay has from here at the New York Comic Con, you know, trying to make it a special interview. Um, but we do the best we can with the time we get, you know, it's still just a blast. So. But guys, I just wanted to take a couple moments to just bring you into the New York Comic Con. Let you see what is going on here as a special treat uh, this Sunday. But all of you guys who are checking it out, or maybe if we missed a little uh, over the weekend uh, uh, and you're catching it later, you get to see what's still going on and check. Otherwise, I'm going to have to check you all later. Peace.